It is Wednesday, August 22nd, 2022. We're here tonight to study the book of Genesis at the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We're glad that you're here. We're glad that you joined us tonight. And we would invite you to join us this coming Lord's Day morning in person at 930 for a Bible study and at 1030 for worship. If you have any questions at all about what you see or hear in our class tonight, give me a call or send a text to 608-224-0274 or send me an email at Four Lakes Church church at gmail.com and we would certainly love to uh, to hear from you. Uh, you guys have done such a good job in bringing school supplies for Kennedy Elementary. Thank you so much for doing that. It's a good thing that we're able to do. We've been blessed with this as an opportunity. And I'm putting the list of items on the screen. These were in the bulletin several weeks ago. If you want to take a screenshot or actually take a picture of your TV or device, this would be a good opportunity to do that. And that would make a good shopping list over the next several weeks. In our family, we helped break in the new Costco down in Verona last week with uh, a purchase of some gallon Ziplocs last, uh, I think it was last Thursday. And many of these items on the list are widely available. Walmart, Walgreens, Costco, Woodman's, any number of places, just about anywhere. And if you're unable to go shopping or if you'd rather have somebody else do that for you, remember you can get funds to Ann Grodi by this coming Sunday, August 28th. And she would be glad to do some shopping for you. Not all of your shopping, just for the kids at Kennedy. <laughs> so uh, get your money uh, to Ann by this coming Sunday, if at all possible. And she'd be glad to help out in uh, getting those things purchased. As we've noted previously, we do have several homeless students in the neighborhood where we worship each week. And this school is about two blocks straight east of us. And these supplies are tremendously appreciated. So thank you so much with your uh, for your help with this. We do have a few more weeks to go until we turn all of these things in. Uh, but these items can be placed under the coat rack in the entryway. And uh, that'd be a good time to just keep on bringing those things. Thank you again for doing that. Uh, tonight, we are back to the book of Genesis. So the book of beginnings written mainly by Moses. We've been looking at a man by the name of Abram for several weeks now. Abram is chosen by God. He's told to leave his homeland to travel to an unknown land. And he does. He obeys God. He is a follower of God's laws. And last week in chapter 14, we saw a coalition of kings from the north northeast swoop down in a raid and they captured Abram's nephew Lot and his family in the process, along with all of their possessions. Well, Abram rustles up his own personal army, 318 from his own household, and Abram takes care of business. As we noted last week, we don't always note or think of Abram as a warrior, but he absolutely was, at least on this occasion, not only rescuing Lot, but coming back with his possessions and a number of other people as well. Toward the end of chapter 14, as he returns home, you may remember from the end of our class last week, Abram is met by the king of Sodom and a priest of God by the name of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek blesses Abram, and Abram gives Melchizedek a tenth of everything. And we tied that into the study of Hebrews, where Melchizedek is mentioned a number of times. And uh, that is the meat of God's word. So we have studied the background to some of the meat of God's word in the New Testament. And that is certainly the value of studying what we would sometimes refer to as being the Old Testament. In this case, the book of Genesis. Well, tonight we pick up with Genesis chapter 15. And I will tell you in advance that Genesis 15 is weird. It, it always seemed weird when I was reading this as a kid. If we ever studied from this, if we covered it in a Bible class, I remember thinking, what in the world? That is a, that is a bizarre chapter. And I think it may be even weirder now that the more I read this, the stranger it gets. So I, I hope that's not disrespectful at all. I'm just acknowledging the reality that Genesis chapter 15 is just a strange chapter to me. And I don't know whether it is to you. But let's just jump right into it tonight by looking at Genesis 15, and let's look at the first four verses. Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abram, I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram had said, Since you have given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, 
This man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body. He shall be your heir. Well, right, a bit, uh, right away, I am a, a little bit surprised that this uh, reassuring message from God uh, comes to Abram after he goes to war with several invading kings and not before he went to war with several invading kings. So that right there just starts off being a little bit unusual to me. So Abram goes to war in the previous chapter. He absolutely dominates that situation. He rescues his nephew and the others and their possessions. And then we have this reminder from God, do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. And I don't know about you, but at least in my mind, there's there's a part of me that's thinking, you know, thanks God, but I really could have used this a few days ago. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense to you. It makes sense to me. Uh, but it certainly would have been very reassuring to have this message before he goes to war instead of after the fact. So God has promised him this land, and, and now it seems as if he will need to put in some uh, serious effort to take it or even keep it. So if I'm Abram, uh, I'm guessing maybe there was some uncertainty, if we could try to figure this out, maybe some uncertainty concerning those kings that he had defeated to rescue Lot. And so, yes, he did well. He uh, got things done. He took care of business. He rescued his nephew and all that. But um, are they coming back? Um, have I just made them mad? Do they have friends? And so I think that's the way I'm looking at this passage at this point in my life. But whatever the possible uh, causes of Abram's fear, God promises to be with him through ever, uh, whatever comes next. Um, I would also note here at the beginning of this chapter that God communicates with Abram through a vision. And sometimes we refer to this as being the patriarchal age. If some of you ever saw the old Jewel Miller film strips or videos, they were uh, good at making a point of... Uh, distinguishing each age from the other. So we have the patriarchal age. In other words, God seems to be communicating primarily through the patriarchs or the fathers, the heads of the families. Uh, the patriarchal age is one of three major divisions of time, spiritually speaking. We have the patriarchal age from Adam to Moses, and I believe continuing on past Moses for those who are not Jews. But then we have the Mosaic Age for the Jews, from Moses until the time of Christ. And then we have the Christian Age, that is, for all people, Jews and Gentiles alike, from Jesus until the end of time. But we are now in the Patriarchal Age in this chapter in Genesis. And in this passage, uh, God communicates directly to Abram, the head of this family, in a vision. So I'm just saying that that uh, keeps uh, with what we know about how God communicated in the Patriarchal Age. The author of Hebrews, by the way, refers to this over in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, when he says, God, after he spoke long ago in the fathers, in the prophets, in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. So I hope we see that in times past, God spoke to the fathers in the prophets, but now, in the last days, in the Christian age, God speaks to us through Jesus, and specifically for us, through the words that have now been written down by Jesus' apostles through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So in that sense, uh, this is the way that the Spirit speaks to us today, through the written word of God. Well, immediately in verse 2, Abram now has a question. So now he's got a concern. Since you're right here speaking with me, Lord... Uh, he's, I can almost see him raising his hand. I have a question. And his question, his concern is, what will you give me since I am childless? And in the question, Abram indicates that his only heir at this point is Eliezer of Damascus. That is one of his servants. So God has promised Abram many descendants. And all Abram can see at this point is Eliezer, one of his servants. And he's obviously concerned. He was an old man before, remember. And a number of years have passed even since the last time God communicated. So maybe a bit confused by this, kind of wanting some uh, clarification from God. And Abram then seems to make a suggestion. He's helping God out here a little bit. And this is what gets Abram in trouble with the whole incident with Sarai and Pharaoh and pretending that she's his sister and all that. So once again, Abram is uh, making some suggestions and here he's saying, well, well, since you've given no offspring to me, notice how he's kind of throwing that back on God. Almost since you have failed to follow through with your promise, 
um, since you have given no offspring to me, like you said that you would, one born in my house, that, that must be my heir, is my heir, he says. And so Abram then is trying to find a workaround. Since I don't have a child of my own, um, maybe this will work. Maybe this is what God has in mind. Maybe someone born in my house may be the answer to this problem. After all, Abram and Sarai are both very old at this point. And so surely this is what God has in mind because nobody this old has kids. However, notice that God responds with a big no. Eliezer will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body will be your heir. So God, therefore, is very, very specific with this. So let's continue on with Genesis 15, verses 5 through 10. Genesis chapter 15, verses 5 through 10. And he took him outside and said, Now look toward the heavens and count the stars, if you are able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Then he believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. He said, O oh Lord God, how may I know that I will possess it? So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer and a three-year-old female goat and a three-year-old ram and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two and laid each half opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds. Well, up in verse 5, notice to try to reassure Abram, God takes him outside, tells him to look up. And just as kind of a side note for us, I would suggest that there is still a huge value to going outside and looking up. When was the last time we went outside to look at the stars? I don't know about you, but sometimes we have a way of getting so busy and, and caught up with uh, work and family things and just the, the things and distractions of this life that we kind of fail to notice God's creation. And I'm not accusing all of us of doing that. I'm just saying that it is a common temptation that we get overwhelmed with the, the way things are going and we end up going to bed just uh, totally tired at night. We just don't have time to go out and, and look around. And and I know that's not the main point of this passage. That's not the point Moses is making for us. But I'm just saying the reference to going outside and, and looking up at the stars simply reminds me that we do need some time outside from time to time. We may, be, uh, may not be able to go camping. That may not be your thing, uh, living in a tent for several days or a week or two. Um, so I'm not saying you have to do that. But I think most of us do have the ability to go outside at night and to at least uh, look up and just to appreciate what God has provided for us. I would highly recommend the SkyMap app. And I'm sure there are others, do whatever you're able to do, whatever's comfortable to you, whatever device that you're using. But if you have the ability to do that, you can pull up the app and just point your phone anywhere in the night sky. And it will actually show you labels of what you're looking at. And there's a little line for the horizon. You can tell it to show you constellations or planets or uh, any number of things, but just a cool thing to do from time to time, just to go outside and to look up and to appreciate what God has done for us. But back to the point of this passage, notice God uses the stars to remind Abram that his descendants would be numerous. If you can count the stars, then you will also be able to count your descendants. And I know through the years, many people have tried to count the stars, um, and they'll come up with, with a number. You know, there were 700 stars. I got it. That's the final answer. And then somebody else, nope, I came up with a thousand. And then, you know, I don't know what it is now. The, the last figure I heard was 25 or 26 sextillion or something like that. Like 26 zeros, kind of just a huge number. And I think I would kind of come to the conclusion that we can't. We cannot count the stars. They are innumerable. And everybody in the past has failed, and I would say we probably will fail at that as well. I can confidently say that the stars will never be numbered. And we were at the Kennedy Space Center down in Florida about a month ago on the day that they had a press conference to uh, reveal the first photos from the James Webb Space Telescope. And I think I read that they focused the telescope on a piece of sky equal to a grain of sand sitting on your fingertip at an arm's length away. 
Can you picture that? So you put a piece of sand, which is interesting, the reference to sand here talking about Abram, but you put a piece of sand on your fingertip, hold it at an arm's length away, and the amount of sky that that piece of sand covers up, that's what they looked at with the James Webb uh, Space Telescope. And the pictures are absolutely stunning. You know, even in a piece of sky that small, we are able to see more stars that we were unable to see just a few months ago. And this is in a part of the sky that previously appeared to us as darkness. There's nothing there. And yet there is. So Abram could not have seen anything if he had looked in that spot, if he had looked in that direction. But now we can. And our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, will probably see many, many times more stars than we can right now. But I'm just saying God uses this very a visual illustration to strengthen Abram's faith. In verse 6, we find that Abram believes in the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. Now, uh, this phrase right here is uh, quoted in Romans 4, Galatians 3, and James chapter 2 to help explain the relationship between faith and works. In Romans and Galatians, Paul seems to be using this as proof that Abraham was pleasing to God many years before the law of Moses went into effect. So if this makes sense, the Jews are talking about the law and they're taking pride in the law. You know, we follow Moses, we do everything, you got to follow Moses to be pleasing to God. And in my understanding of those quotes where Paul brings this up, he's saying, not so fast. Faith in God came many years before Moses. Was not Abraham pleasing to God before the law of Moses went into effect? And so Paul was explaining the order of things here. Um, in James, James was using this to illustrate that faith without works is dead. After all, remember, at this point in his life, Abraham had already demonstrated his faith through his works. He had already obeyed God's law. He had already moved from Haran to Canaan and so on. So I would just mention that Abram is already saved at this point, as far as we can tell. He didn't go from being lost to being saved in this passage. He's already obedient. He's already acting on his faith. Uh, but at this point in his life, he finally and truly believes that God will, in fact, give him an heir. And he'll waver on this even in the coming chapters. But Abram does believe it at this point. And God credits his faith as righteousness in this passage. Uh, the way this is translated in the New Testament, Paul and James basically use an accounting term. Uh, today, we might imagine a column in an Excel spreadsheet or something. You know, God now puts Abram's faith in the credit category. So he now credits his faith as righteousness. Notice in verse 7, God gives the reminder, I'm the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. And to me, this sounds very similar to how God would identify himself to the Israelites in the future. I'm the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt and so on. And so God then is reminding Abram, I've done this for you. I've been with you through these years and I will be with you in the future. And sometimes I wonder, how would God identify himself to us today? He didn't bring us out of Ur of the Chaldeans. He didn't bring us up out of Egypt as he did the Israelites. But if God were to speak to us today, well, how would he identify himself to us? I'm guessing he would identify himself as the Lord God who has forgiven your sins or something to that effect, something along those lines. But at this point, though, Abram, notice he has a follow-up question, doesn't he? A little bit more here. So in verse 8, uh, Abram replies to all of this, O Lord God, how may I know that I will possess it? So as faithful as he is, Abram wants some assurance. And to me, this is where it gets a little bit weird or more weird, we might say. Uh, God tells Abram to bring him a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, and a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And I'm kind of wondering, why three years old on the first three? And why any of this? And then why does Abram do what he does next? Uh, the three-year-old thing, some have suggested this is the age of maturity for these three animals. Uh, but in verse 10, it seems that Abram is the one who brings these animals then to God and cuts them in two. And he then lays the halves opposite each other without cutting the birds. Can you see this? Okay, you got these three animals and he slices them in half and lays them open. And he, he lays them there in this line before the Lord and he doesn't cut the birds. And again, that's, that's kind of weird. And so I'm guessing we may be 
missing something here? Obviously, the, the explanation is not really given in this passage. Maybe God told him to do this, but we just aren't told about it. Kind of similar to Abel offering a sacrifice by faith, which is according to the word of God, but we don't have the word of God explaining the exact sacrifice they were to give, so we assume they had it and we don't. Uh, but again, we may just not have enough information here, but to me it's a bit strange to cut these animals clean in half and then to lay them out like this. We may actually have an answer from history, as well as from an obscure reference in Jeremiah. Apparently it was a custom at the time to ratify an agreement by slicing animals in half, and then the two parties would walk between the halves, basically promising that if they violated the covenant, that they would wish themselves to be sliced in half just like the animals. And I read a couple references to this as I was preparing tonight's lesson, that in ancient secular literature we have this, you know, kings and their people, they would be going through and slicing animals in half and walking between them and that kind of thing. And the reference in Jeremiah is Jeremiah 34, 18 through 20, where God says, I will give the men who have transgressed my covenant, who have not fulfilled the words of the covenant which they made before me, when they cut the calf in two and passed between its parts, the officials of Judah and the officials of Jerusalem, the court officers and the priests and all the people of the land, who passed between the parts of the calf, I will give them into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their life. And their dead bodies will be food for the birds of the sky and the beasts of the earth." I don't know if you can hear the beagle alarm going off right now. That's one of the few times this has actually happened during a class. So I'm assuming we're getting a UPS uh, delivery or somebody's breaking in my house about to do terrible things. Uh, hopefully she'll calm down in just a little bit. But again, on this splitting animals in half, my dog probably heard me talk about cutting animals in half. Um, but on this reference, we don't have too much information. We don't have the details. We've got this little reference over in Jeremiah. We've got some secular history on this. But it seems to confirm what we know from outside sources that maybe this was at one time a way of ratifying an agreement. So today we may sign our names on a dotted line, uh, something like that. But back then they apparently sliced animals in half and walked between the pieces, which again is kind of weird. So let's continue with Genesis 15 verses 11 through 16. Genesis 15 verses 11 through 16. The birds of prey came down upon the carcasses. And Abram drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. God said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed four hundred years. But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions." As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You will be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation, they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. This is obviously a continuation of Abram slicing the animals in half and uh, lining them up opposite each other. Now we have these uh, vultures or uh, something, birds of prey coming down to try to uh, devour the carcasses. And Abram has to drive them away. So apparently then some time has passed, not a long time, less than a day, because what happens next will happen that night. So a few hours pass or whatever, enough time for the birds of prey to find out, hey, look, there's some animals sliced in half down there. Let's go feast. And so, um, and we're not, again, we're not told exactly that God has asked for this um, to be laid out in this way, the animals and all that. So it's a bit weird, but Abraham, uh, Abram protects the carcasses, kind of keeping the, uh, the birds from eating here. Uh, Neil Pollard, a friend of mine who now preaches in Kentucky, he makes an interesting observation on this passage, uh, just noting the strange reference to Abram driving away the birds of prey. And Neil asks the question, have you ever had to do that when you worshipped? Not literally, but have we ever had to fight off distractions during worship? Like an uninvited thought, or maybe an action by a song leader, or maybe something a fellow worshiper does, or the room temperature, or a distracting noise in the auditorium. You know, often birds of prey, in a sense, will try to interrupt our worship today in that they'll sabotage what we're doing. And sometimes we also need to drive those distractions away. Sometimes we need to refocus on worship, reminding ourselves why we are doing what we are doing. Again, not that that's the main point, 
of this passage. It is not. It is not applied that way in Scripture. Uh, but it's just an observation that Brother Neil made when he read this passage. In verse 12, as the sun is going down, Abram falls into a deep sleep. And this doesn't sound like he's just drifting off. This is a deep sleep. I think the same word is used to describe um, what, do, what God did for Adam when he removed the rib. So he falls into this deep sleep. He is then immersed in terror and darkness. So absolutely terrifying. Bad, bad dreams. Terrible things going on here. And in this state of terror, God speaks to Abram again and says his descendants will be enslaved. They will be oppressed in a foreign land for 400 years. That's the bad news. The good news is that God will hold the foreign nation accountable. And Abram's descendants will eventually leave that land with many possessions. So they will, in fact, come out on top. That's all Abram is told at this point. But we obviously identify this as the time the Israelites will spend in Egypt. Like looking back on it, now we know what he's talking about. And then also we have a reference here to the Exodus under Moses. They will leave and they will take things with them. They will come out wealthy. Uh, as for Abram, he doesn't really need to worry about this, does he? He'll be long gone. So he will definitely be dead by then. Uh, but even the reference to death is rather comforting here as we find that Abram will go to his fathers in peace, having been buried at a good old age. And the other good news is that when the slavery and oppression is over, Abram's descendants will then return to this place, that is the promised land, uh, where Abram is in this chapter. Down in verse 16, we have a reason for the 400 years of slavery and oppression. For the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. As I understand this, as I see this, God is explaining that he would let Abram uh, not move into the promised land immediately. So Abram uh, will not live here. You know, his people will not live here from now for eternity, but there is a time when they will need to leave and the locals are not quite evil enough yet to get annihilated right away. And so as I understand this, God will patiently wait until the locals are bad enough to deserve getting wiped off the face of the earth. And to me, that's interesting. God is incredibly patient. And I note from this passage that God will even allow his own people to suffer as he gives others, outsiders, every possible opportunity to repent. Well, of course, later as they prepare to enter the promised land, God gives the a long list of things they are not to do. So they are not to participate in homosexuality. They are not to mate with animals and all these things. And then in that context, I want us to note the reason for this in Leviticus 18, 24 through 30. God says, do not defile yourselves by any of these things, those things I just referred to. For by all these, the nations which I am casting out before you have become defiled. For the land has become defiled, therefore I have brought its punishment upon it. So the land has spewed out its inhabitants. But as for you, you are to keep my statutes and my judgments, and shall not do any of these abominations, neither the native nor the alien who sojourns among you. For the men of the land who have been before you, you have uh, uh, who have been before you have done all these abominations, and the land has become defiled, so that the land will not spew you out. Should you defile it as it is spewed out the nation which has been before you? For whoever does any of these abominations, those persons who do so shall be cut off from among their people. Thus you are to keep my charge that you do not practice any of the abominable customs which have been practiced before you, so as not to defile yourselves with them. I am the Lord your God. Well, I'm just suggesting we have the first hint of this right here in Genesis 15 16. The people who lived in the promised land were very, very evil. Sometimes, though, as we study through Joshua, there are a lot of people who may criticize God for committing genocide. Have we heard that objection? People will say, well, I don't believe in God. Look at what he did. He told them to go out and wipe out complete villages and cities and complete people groups, and I, I can't believe in a God like that. Uh, my friend Michael Whitworth wrote a book on Genesis a few years ago, and on this passage, he makes this comment. When some read Joshua's account of Canaan's conquest, they impose upon the text a caricature of a capricious, vindicative, de vindicative deity ordering the genocide of a peaceful, indigenous people. But that is completely inconsistent with the biblical record. What kind of God gives a nation four centuries 
to get their moral act together. One who is as loving as he is sovereign and as gracious as he is holy. So I'm just saying we can get that out of verse 16. Um, the, uh, the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. They are not evil enough quite yet to deserve getting wiped off the face of the earth. That's why I'm going to leave your people in Egypt for 400 years while that happens. So let's conclude tonight with Genesis 15 verses 17 through 21. Genesis 15 verses 17 through 21. It came about when the sun had set that it was very dark. And behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch, which passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, from the river of Egypt, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenite, and the Kenizzite, and the Cadmonite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Rephaim, and the Amorite, and the Canaanite, and the Girgashite, and the Jebusite. So once again, a little bit strange here, isn't it? We've got Abram, we've got these animals split in half, and now what do we have? We've got a smoking oven and a flaming torch passing between the pieces. And again, this right here has always been very unusual to me. But once the smoking oven and the torch pass between the pieces, God once again makes this covenant, this agreement this treaty, or we may say, in a sense at least, with Abram. So God promises this land to Abram's descendants. And then there at the end of this chapter, he lists the people who were currently living in it. Well, as we go back over the promises that are made and renewed in this chapter, I want to just briefly share here at the end a few references from the future. Several hundred years later, we have an interesting statement by Moses as he speaks to the people right before they cross over the Jordan River to take back this land that we're talking about here tonight. So over in Deuteronomy 1, verses 10 and 11, this is what Moses says. The Lord your God has multiplied you, and behold, you are this day like the stars of heaven in number. May the Lord, the God of your fathers, increase you a thousandfold more than you are and bless you just as he has promised you. Isn't that interesting? This is near the end of Moses' life, and here he is. This is, he, this is as far as he can go. He's not crossing the river with the rest of them. And as he looks out over these people, numbering maybe two or three million at this point, he sees God's promise fulfilled, doesn't he? He's saying, you are now numbered like the number of stars in the heavens. So they have grown from just a few, basically Abraham's family, to now a nation of many. So now that promise has been fulfilled. Several years later, after this, in Joshua 11, 23, after they conquer the land and move in, now the Bible says this in Joshua 11, 23. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord had spoken to Moses. And Joshua gave it for an inheritance to Israel according to their divisions by their tribes. Thus the land had rest from war. Do you see why we're looking at that verse right here? This is the fulfillment of that promise that was made many years prior. And then a number of years after this, under Solomon, uh, under King Solomon, the borders expanded even more. And we come to 1 Kings 4.21, where the Bible says this, Now Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from the river to the land of the Philistines and to the border of Egypt. They brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. And so God had fulfilled his promise to Abraham. But remember, as we learn later, that promise is conditional. You are not to behave like the people before you. Otherwise, the land may spew you out just as it did them. For, but at least for now, we have this promise uh, from God to Abram fulfilled. And this is where we'll leave it tonight. Abram is a little bit older. He still doesn't have a child of his own. But God renews that covenant by passing through these animals that had been sliced in half. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. I hope to see you this coming Lord's Day at 930. We're getting back to our brand new study of Isaiah. And then we also plan on coming together at 1030 for our worship assembly as we continue with the fifth of the eight Beatitudes. But let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the God of Abraham, a great and powerful God who keeps his promises from one generation to the next. 
Father, we certainly do not deserve your grace and your mercy, but we are especially thankful for your patience with us, reminding us of your promises and for crediting our faith as righteousness, even when we fall short. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. In Jesus, we pray. Amen.